Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm here to review Been Here a Thousand Years by Mariolina Venezia for Women in Translation Month. In a shocking twist of fate, this is the first book in four years I've reviewed for this project that is not by an Israeli author. <laughs> Women in Translation Month was started in 2014 by book blogger uh, Maytel Verdzinski. She noticed a dearth in English language markets of translated fiction written by women. This month was meant to bring attention to those authors and translators. I'll link to more information about WIT Month down below. Been Here a Thousand Years was translated from the Italian by Marina Harz. I first heard about this book five years ago from an article in Book Riot entitled Reading Across Italy. About this novel, Rachel Cordasco wrote, Venezia offers us a sweeping view of Italian history as it was lived by five generations of a single family. Set in Gratelle, this is the story of Francesco Falcone, a wealthy landowner, Concetta, his mistress, and their many children, grandchildren, etc., etc. As with any family history, this one includes joys, tragedies, disappointment, and delight. A must-read for anyone interested in Italian cultural history. El Mundo from Spain blurbed that this book echoes the magical realism of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Latin American magical realism is seen as a distinct form, as Jen from Insert Literary Pun reminded us recently. In her WIT Month video, A Tangent-Filled TBR, she says, there's a real political backbone that is often absent from other novels that we call magical realist, uh, just for their fabulous elements. I think she would agree that this Italian novel is definitely political, and if anything is kind of light on the magical realism. It's true that this book begins with a bizarre scene of olive oil, first mistaken for piss, rolling through the alleyways of Gratole. And this is because Concetta screamed so loud during her labor pains that she broke the jars of olive oil that Don Francesco was uh, storing for his family. But that's not exactly fantastical. It's the fact that Venezia covers so much ground in so little space, 130 years and under 300 pages, that gives the novel a fairy tale feel. The moral of this story is that the women of the family long for life and love, and take ever broadening circles out of Gratole. But the ones we follow come back and ultimately feel indifferent at best toward their daughters and their husbands. Frankly, I think there were too many characters in here and not enough to remember them by. It truly feels like, as Candida, one of the characters, says at the end of the novel, that they've been here for a thousand years doing the same thing over and over. The last descendant, Gioia, keeps popping up decades and centuries before she was born, which obviously made her the protagonist. Not that she's an apparition or anything, but it's more about the narrator making foreshadowing remarks. But once Gioia's life slides into the historical timeline, Venezia does give her the most amount of pages. Gioia doesn't get married and have a daughter, although occasional asides do uh, reference that other life and what might have happened. Instead, she moves to Paris as a sort of vagabond come actress. She has a love affair with a Greek expatriate, Spyros. When it ends tragically, Venezia interdisperses scenes from the death of Gioia's uh, great-great-grandfather, uh, Francesco. It seems a little nonsensical, except that both of these characters were duped by uh, political situations beyond their control. The novel opens in 1861, when Rome was chosen as the capital city for the newly unified Italy. It closes in 1989, when the Berlin Wall comes down, and hence Berlin the city is reunified. The war in Italy led to bandits coming to Gratole and they ultimately murder Francesco for double-crossing them. Decades later, Spyros uh, uses Gioia as a cover for a business deal that allows him to return to Greece. But the fall of communism is much more compelling. Of all the wars and political movements that Venezia teases in this novel, communism is the most outsized. Everything else more or less exists in the background, but Gioia's father, Rocco, gets pretty heavily involved in the party in his youth. But by 1989, communism is mostly seen for its flaws. 
that same year, Gioia, who had a dream of living a life away from her family and their history, ultimately returns home. This has been a difficult novel to script a video about. When I was reading it, the halfway lyrical and halfway luridly crass writing would compel me for a while. But if I stepped away, I'd often forget details. To be quite honest, I kind of miss my Israeli fiction. That being said, I think the most memorable character in here is, well, Southern Italy. The hard scrabble land where everybody has to fight for their piece of the pie. Viewed by their neighbors to the north as a place of primitive anarchy. Like the residents are scalping Indians from a western movie one character thinks to herself when traveling there. Maybe it sticks out to me because my grandfather's family is Neapolitan from southern Italy. So I appreciate the attempt to give uh, Gratole a little more dimension. So that about covers it for me now. You can find links to all the various things I've talked about, including my Goodreads review for this book, linked down below. I should be back tomorrow to talk about my Friday reads. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying your Women in Translation Month, and I'll see you next time.